Hi. And for those that don't know you, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Rob Connick. I'm the artistic director of Laugh Performing Arts Company, and I've been the director for several of the shows throughout the first two seasons, including uh, Prometheus Reimagined, It's a Wonderful Lie, True Love, Agamemnon, Heathen Valley, and Jet of Blood. So, what is Laugh Riot? Uh, Laugh Riot Performing Arts Company is a theater designed and put together specifically to bring theater that addresses social issues to an audience, and we focus specifically on the relationship between actor and audience. We're most interested in creating shows that really feed off of that connection. We're not looking for something that deals a whole lot with tech. We want to focus on creating interaction and connection and memories directly with audience so that they leave and they talk about the show. We invite them after the shows to have a talk back where we talk about the process and ideas and things that came up with the shows. We want to create a community that can talk about theater and that can talk about ideas that happen on stage and what can be done to either fix those issues or even ask if those issues need to be fixed. So you've mentioned a couple of the productions. Uh, Prometheus, uh, It's a Wonderful Lie, Blackbird. Um, let's uh, give us a little bit of a retrospective of the first season and Take us a little bit on the journey okay. of start. Well, for our first season, we wanted to choose things that were, one, in our wheelhouse already. Things that I was comfortable doing that we thought that we could do with an imagined community. We didn't necessarily have knowledge of what type of actors we would have available. So we started with Prometheus Reimagined. It was an adaptation written by a friend of mine from Bowling Green that gave us permission to use his adapted work. And it was open-ended. We could use four people. We could use 400 people. That was one of the nice things about it is as long as we had a key core, we could do the show. And we had a key core of about six people and then as soon as the semester started here the show was going to open Thursday we had people join us that Monday before we opened as part of our chorus and improvised movement group and I thought that gave us a good jumping off point because it set us up as a very different theater company we were doing things that most other theater companies wouldn't do because it was very movement heavy, it was very improvisational. I remember having conversations with two area directors who both told me that they would never have felt comfortable bringing a key part of their show in on Monday, having it be improvised and be ready to put in front of an audience on Thursday. They didn't trust actors enough to be able to do that, and I did and went for it, and I thought that it worked very well. It, I was very impressed with the critical response that we got to it, and that set us up for our next show, which was It's a Wonderful Lie. That was again written by a friend of mine, and it gave the first clear sense of what the Laugh Riot aesthetic would be for a traditionally staged show. That there was that little bit of a satiric dark twist to it that it was a holiday show based primarily on people that don't like the holidays the people that identify more with the Grinch than with the Hallmark specials and I think that appealed to people maybe not to as wide an audience but that's kind of what Laugh Riot is we may not appeal to every single person but to those people that we do appeal to, there's nothing in the area that fills that niche that we do. 
we approach and do theater that the other places can't or won't do. Um, the other places do very good shows. The Playhouse does great shows. All in Act does great shows. Drama Shop does great shows. That doesn't mean that they do everything that the market wants. We provide that other alternative. So then we moved to Blackbird. Yes. Which was very well received and certainly a controversial show in a number of ways. Um, from that kind of stepping off point, what do you think with, with that type of show, uh, did it do as far as getting noticed, getting attention, getting, you know, different types of, then let's say Prometheus and It's a Wonderful Lie had received? Oh, one of the things with Blackbird that I thought worked very well is that was the first script that we paid royalties for. And we chose that one specifically because of the power of the script. We're not always going to do devised work. Every year we want to do at least one established play. But we do that with very specific goals in mind. When we do a show like that, we want to do a show that's going to have an impact. And Blackbird had that impact. It was incredibly well received. It also made me feel very good as the artistic director to know that the show that got probably the best critical praise out of our season was one that I was not involved with. That I chose a great show, I chose a great director in Audrey Schweitzer, and she got a great cast and got a great performance out of all of them. And that wasn't anything that I did. All I was responsible for was finding the director and finding the script. So, so then we moved to True Love. Yes. Which is a very different show again. Right. Um, True Love was our first jump into Charles Mee and his view of the Greeks. Um, one of the things that we did notice is that no one around here does Greek plays, either in its original form or even in trans translation and adaptation. Um, Gannon and Alanac have the Shakespeare market cornered between Gannon's Summer Shakespeare series and Alanac's at least usual annual production of at least one Shakespeare. There's already a market for that. We didn't feel that we needed to necessarily jump in there. With the Greeks, there's stories that have lasted 2,000, 2,500 years, they've lasted this long because there's something there about them that still rings true. And True Love dealt with one of the more obscure stories with Phaedra and Hippolytus and that idea of forbidden love and what happens when you cross the god of love is that sometimes you can't change or decide who you love and who you don't and how do you manage that when you know that what you love and what you desire is wrong that was a show that pushed a lot of boundaries it's a show that wasn't originally on our schedule but one of the shows that was needed an acting pool that we don't have we thought that it might be there and when it wasn't there we looked at true love because it fit the acting pool that we had much better. And that was the first one that really pushed us into this area that we've become a little more better known for that we can do between Blackbird followed up with True Love, these edgier pieces that allow us to go to the dark places that people normally don't like to go to. And when they go there, it's uncomfortable for everyone. But compared to other organizations, which may on occasion go to those dark places just for the sake of going there, you know, I, I feel that there's a key difference with Laugh Riot that it's not, it's not being controversial for controversial sake. It's telling a story that happens to be controversial, but that it's telling it because it's a story that needs to be told, not just to get, you know, people in a huff. Right. We don't want to be exploitative. 
We don't want to do something just to go look at how edgy we are, look at how different we are. That's navel-gazing to me. It's self-aggrandizing. It doesn't bring anything for the audience. That, that type of theater is done more for the benefit of the actors and the director. That it's more of a, look at what I can do, look at what, look at how edgy I can be, look at how far I can push myself to different degrees without necessarily giving the audience something to go with. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that True Love did stir up a lot of very uncomfortable emotions and responses from people, and there was never any nudity on stage, there was never any physical tenderness. There were people in their underwear, and there were people that came close to kissing, but there was no actual sexual contact. There was no nudity, but it still felt taboo, and it still felt like we were seeing more than we actually did. And that's what I think good theater can do. You don't have to go completely to the edge and go past it to show these things. If we do have a nude scene that ever happens, it's going to be specifically because the play requires it. If it doesn't require it, I'm going to try and find ways to give that idea and get that intention there without making it something that can be exploited. Because one of the things that happens when you do those type of edgy, exploitative things is that it's very easy for the intention to get lost in translation. You can want something to happen with it, but people will not, you can't force people to read it that way. Nude scenes, and I think you can see that with film, and even through the history of theater, a nude scene becomes an objectification scene no matter what. There's going to be somebody in that audience that isn't going to get why it's there and instead just take it as, I get to see a naked body. So we try and skew that and make it so anti-erotic, so based in the play that when these scenes come close to that, that it's not a nude scene, it's a scene that's raw and real and honest. So from uh, True Love, we then go to the New Works Festival. New Works Festival, which is something a little bit different. Um, I mean, there's there's organizations that are now uh, joining with that. Uh, Drama Shops doing their first new work as part of their third season. Uh, what uh, what did you take away from the New Works Festival? being the first time and with trying something like this? Um, as with many first things, we had a bit of a rough go with it at first. We got several good scripts. The hard part was that we put it over the summer. And being a resident theater at Edinburgh University, there's not a whole lot of people around here during the summer. So that part did not work quite as planned. But what I thought worked very well is that we did have three scripts that had never seen the stage before. And that it gave playwrights a chance to see their work on stage. Um, I know two of the playwrights had never had any work put on stage before. So that ability to see and hear their words were as important to them as it was to the directors who had a chance and to the actors who had a chance. Since then, I've already received responses from people that would like to direct in our new works festival this year. I've already got submissions from playwrights asking specifically what type of stuff are we looking for. So it's built stronger already for the second year than we had for the first. And then, so then the, the final production which was, in a sense, the first production of the second season, but the last production, truly, uh, beginning at the semester, um, was Heathen Valley. Let's talk a little bit about Heathen Valley. Uh, you were a director in it. Yes. Also uh, had a large part in it. 
What was a little bit different experience being both on stage and then on the other side? Um, with Heathen Valley, I stepped in shortly before rehearsal started and before auditions as the director. It was a play that I was very familiar with from before, so when we needed a director for it, I was able to jump in because I knew the story very well. I had been involved in two productions previous. Again, having to cast over the summer, we found that we were calling in favors to get people on stage, which made it so that I had to take two different hats and be director slash actor. When I knew that was going to happen, I asked Kristen Porter, who had assistant directed several times with me, to be the assistant co-director for that, because I knew that those times when I was on stage, she would have that director's eye that could help tell, tell us what was working, what wasn't working, and help fix the problem areas that come when you've got a director that's on stage that can't see everything because they've got that point of view from that actor, that character, right on stage. Now this was also Laugh Riot's uh, first experience with doing a little bit of outdoor theater, having one production outdoor. Um, what did you take away from that and what do you hope to do with that type of venue in the future? Um, one, of, one of the things that made us choose Heathen Valley from the get-go was that it was a good story that didn't need technical components to make it work. It specifically called for very little set for very few light changes. It was really about these characters. So during move-in weekend here on campus, we did a show outside during Sunday afternoon. And the space that we use works very well as an outdoor theater. The amplification that happens there allows the volume to go for much farther than I thought it would that you can be heard hundreds of yards away even though you're down basically in a ditch. And we thought that it worked very well. Some of the things that we took away from it are definitely with an outdoor theater show, you don't want to show with an intermission because people will stay, but once you give them an opportunity to leave, they're not a captive audience necessarily. You catch them because they hear something going on. Once their attention has been lost, they're going back to whatever it was that they had planned for that afternoon. Which is the exact same thing my mother said coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> now, what types of things would you want to bring in that kind of similar space as far as an outdoor space? I would say almost any show that you can take that really focuses just on the actors and the audience, I think would be a wonderful fit outdoor. I think there isn't enough outdoor theater. It's something that gets the community involved because people may not know that something's going on if they just walk past a building. But if they see something going on outside, they're going to stop at least for a couple minutes and take a look. They may not stay for the whole thing, but they may see something and stop and sit longer than you would have thought they would. And those are people that never would have seen any of that theater if it wasn't outside. It's obviously something that we don't get paid to do. We don't have ticket sales for outdoor theater, but it is something that allows people to come in and out based on their free time. It allows little glimpses and usually, if it catches someone's eye enough that they stop for a bit, they may want to come back and see it as a fully staged production the next day or some other time. Or they may see enough that when they hear about our next show, go, oh, that sounds interesting. I like the little bit that I saw. I'll go check it out. All right. Thank you so much. Certainly.